welcome to Entrepreneur Life, the show about you, the business owner. Here we find out what drives business owners, what's their purpose, and what motivates them. Today we have Ramon Ray, who is a technological evangelist, a business advocate, and the publisher of Smart Hustle magazine. Ramon, thanks for coming to the show. You're welcome, and thank you for that powerful introduction. Thank you. Well, you're a powerful person. <laughs> uh, Ramon, we met through the Manhattan Chamber of Commerce, mm -hmm. and I've seen your business over the past few years go through a few changes. So I'd like to know how you started as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, what kind of business you were in, and uh, where it all began. Sure. Uh, the answer to the first part is an accident. My whole life has been one big accident. Uh, so as far as entrepreneurial, I didn't know what it was to be an entrepreneur, uh, but I did know that Inc. Magazine and Black Enterprise asked me a couple years ago, many years ago, 20 years ago, give or take, Ramon, can you write for us? And I was like, oh my God, that's awesome. <laughs> I get to write for you. Then they're saying, can we pay you to write? I didn't know there was such a thing as paying people to write. I mean, God bless America. And, uh, and then that was that. So I realized I can be paid to write. And the next thing I know is also asked to speak at some events. And again, the same thing. Wow, okay, how do I fly there? And then somebody said, what's your speaker's fee? My speaker's fee? You're crazy. And uh, next thing you know, I'm a paid speaker. So that's really how, it, how it's grown, just by knowing that people see value in something that you do and I pay you to do it. And so that's really how it started. And from there, I've launched a number of ventures and done a variety of things, but that's, that's how it started. And, uh, and so far, it seems to be working okay. So Tell us about your family background and how you started in technology, in marketing, and how to be an advocate for business owners. Sure. Um, I was born in a small town in the Midwest and had uh, two awesome parents and a nice family. And uh, how I started in the world of technology, I think, was uh, from a young age. I was the type of kid who would tear apart Hess trucks, tear apart Teddy Ruxby's, find out how they worked, and create uh, shortwave radios connected to pipes. I think that knowledge just carried me on to being an adult and being one who was inquisitive about how things work. Uh, and if, if I didn't know how they worked, wanting to find out. So that's a summary of my technology background. Is anyone in your family an entrepreneur? Uh, not really. I mean, a lot of my family are smart. Uh, a lot of them are on entrepreneurial mindset, but no one really owns their own business, at least in my immediate family. So I guess I'm the first one. So what's an entrepreneurial mindset? I think an entrepreneur is one who has their own business, takes risk, experiences failure, and experiences the sweet taste of success. I think a mindset, if you take a look at anybody who's in your typical cubicle or works for someone, I believe that you can still be a risk taker, still be on the edge, still think outside the box if you work for somebody else. So that's what I mean by an entrepreneurial mindset. You don't have to always just follow the drumbeat of, of what you're told to do, not in a bad way, but that I think if you're doing your job well, people expect you to give ideas and to create other than what's just normal, following the, the a hard trodden path. So that's the stuff that makes managers within yes. an organization. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So that yeah. entrepreneurial mindset. Yeah. And did you, uh, you said that you wrote uh, a lot, mm -hmm. and how did they find you? I think that was before the internet? Sure, before blogging and content was popular. So I think I've always been one who's uh, written a lot. I used to have a paper, as in paper, as in you can rip it, uh, <laughs> newsletter that I would send to my clients when I was doing some consulting at the time. Uh, while, by the way, I was working at the United Nations at the same time. And uh, I discovered the internet in the Jacob Javits Center whatever it was. In the internet, I mean really the World Wide Web. And I started transitioning my paper newsletter to be online. And really from there was the start of me being online. I used to use a, pro a, a program to publish on the internet, and I would save my content at three times a day, save it in something called FTP, File Transfer Protocol, save it. And then I realized I could use another program from uh, called Blogger. Um, and from there I transitioned to movable Press and then went to WordPress. So yes, I've had a long experience writing content, but it started from a simple piece of paper. Wow, viva la paper. Absolutely. <laughs> so uh, you, you, so early on, you you learned technology and how to use technology, mm -hmm. and uh, are you able to keep 
keep going with it? Are you able to keep current? Because technology changes and there's so many new software programs, some apps. I mean, how do you deal with that? I'll answer that question in two ways. I think that there are some of us who are in the position of we are teachers and speakers of it. We are not necessarily practitioners like a coder or a developer or one who's building a computer. So I used to do that. I had a technology consulting firm so I can put together computers. I can steal code, can't create it myself. Um, but the point is, so, but now that I'm in a position to speak and to write and to produce, I share with others. As far as keeping up with technology, right, it advances extraordinarily fast. But what I do with that is I have a focus. My focus is the technology for small businesses. I don't deal with big businesses. I don't deal with any other kind of businesses that very small businesses. And within that, the focus is really marketing technologies to a degree. So in that rubric, if I stay in my lane, I don't worry about wearables, I don't worry about infrared, I don't worry about security. In the greater sense, it's really the focus of small business technology. And there I can keep up relatively decent. And you also wrote a few books. I did. My first two books were, uh, well, one, my first book was self-published. I said, I'm just going to write a book because nobody else will publish it, so screw it. I'll do it myself. And then the second one was uh, Technology Resources for Growing Businesses with uh, the American Management Association. And my third book is a bestseller done with Facebook, and that's the Facebook Guide to Small Business Marketing. So I've, again, I love to write. I love to share. And so you write all the time. Yeah, relatively. <laughs> and uh, you also said you never had a television that in is your correct. home. Yeah. What was that like? Uh, well, I had a television for the first three years of my life. So uh, when it was thrown out, I think at the beginning you don't know, oh, my God, there's no television. How will I breathe? How will I eat? <laughs> How will I think? But uh, after the television's gone, you realize that, oh, my God, you can, you can still learn. And so it, it, was, it was hard, difficult at first, but I think uh, not having one, you know, didn't affect me so much. And now today in the last several years, with the rise, of course, of Netflix and Hulu and YouTube and other technologies, it's probably pretty much a mute point. Right. So you still don't have a TV in your household. I do not have a TV in my household. With your, your wife and your Do not. As a full-fledged adult, I do not have one. Excellent. So that's how you really get a lot done. It could be. I mean, you're right, because I think that when you have a TV, you're just flipping it on, you sit and stare at it. So I think it helps you be more productive to a degree, right. at least the habit of not having that box to stare at and control your mind. Right. So uh, as an author, an entrepreneur, one who advocates for, for businesses or business learning, mm -hmm. let's say, using technology, how did you come to be the publisher of Smart Hustle Magazine? Sure. So Smart Hustle Magazine was a magazine that I launched last year. Um, and when I say launched, Angela, I'm talking about the idea. I bought the domain name for $7,000 from some guy in Sweden on my credit card, and I had no clue what I'm doing. Angela, you'll find that I'm a guy who does a lot of things, and I don't know what I'm doing, but that's just me. And, um, and so I launched it, built a website, didn't work quite well, lost some money. But the point is today that we have a physical magazine, a product. And, um, and let's uh, hold that up. Okay, sure, yeah. And, and with this a camera. is on its. Uh, this and is on its. Uh, can you, Cam? Can we close in on this? So we're uh, all right. We're closing in on uh, this cover. Mm -hmm. This is the printed copy, That's right. the paper, mm -hmm. original paper, paper copy of Smart Hustle magazine. And but your magazine is online monthly, That's right. right? We come out uh, every week on, uh, online via email newsletter, and then every three months it comes out uh, in print. So that's Smart Hustle Magazine. And I launched it because really, Angela, I've been a technology evangelist, uh, but I enjoy people. I enjoy finding out people's lives. And I said through Smart Hustle, I can then grow this business and I can talk about talk about things beyond just technology. So that's hence my desire and birth of Smart Hustle Magazine. And what would an entrepreneur learn about this magazine? Sure, from uh, or from this magazine. Magazine. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, inside, really, the, the focus of the magazine is all about the hustle. I want to talk to people who are in the grind, like myself, who are not perfect, who make a lot of mistakes, uh, but they're on a journey of success and or people who've already been successful. I can think of people like uh, Johnny Earl, uh, who has a company that, that's called uh, Cupcakes, but they sell t-shirts. Or I think of uh, other entrepreneurs who are in the hustle and the grind and have had to work hard and do it, like, like yourself, Angela. So that's really what they'll find. Every, every week, they'll find a story of an entrepreneur who's in the hustle, and they'll find other great content focused on technology, marketing, finance, and operations. So it's really a, a publication that you can learn something in almost every area Absolutely. about being an entrepreneur. Absolutely. And you can find it online yep. or on print. Absolutely. It's free. It is free. It's free. And uh, is there anything else you want to tell us about yourself or your business? Or what kind of message would you give out there to future or existing entrepreneurs? Yeah. Now? I think uh, it's important to work hard. 
I think it's important to work hard, but work smart, because you can work hard and work stupidly. So I think working hard and working smart is good. Um, I think you have to be a risk taker, trust people, get a, get advice from other people, and always be learning. I think if you can't, if you if you think that you've learned and you have arrived, then you've just game's over. So if you can always be hungry to learn, uh, I think you'd be on the right track. That's great. Ramon, that's a great insight, great advice, and I want to thank you for coming on the thank show you. and sharing your experience, and much success with Smart Hustle Magazine and any other endeavor that you have. I thank appreciate you. it. Pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce a very well-known restaurant owner. His name is Joey D'Alessio. He is the owner of the Mansion Grand. And I happen to know Joey for a very long time. Joey, welcome to the show today. Pleasure to see you again, Angela. And Joey, and I invited Joey here because we grew up from the same neighborhood in Bath Beach, yep. in Brooklyn, in the Bay Streets. And uh, we grew up from a blue collar, working <coughs> class neighborhood. And we just knew each other, uh, you know, from, from crowds that we hung out with. And uh, Joey, how did you ever get on this path of being an entrepreneur, a <laughs> restaurateur, and you know, how did it all begin? It was a strange road, to say the least. Uh, probably originally started when I was uh, much younger, I would say in my late teens. I got involved in the automobile business back in our old neighborhood. <clears throat> I was basically a car mechanic and things like that, but I eventually evolved into being a car salesman. As being a car salesman, then a car, used car manager, and then a sales manager, I developed skills and a very strong liking for people. Getting to know people, getting to like people, getting to read people, basically a, a, a study of human nature. So that became like part of my, I, I guess you want to call it professional skills, I carried on from there. Prior to that, as far as food part of the business, I didn't have much experience other than maybe a short order cook in a well-known uh, little place that we used to hang out when as kids called the Dyker Drive-In, <laughs> a.k.a. the Manja Booth. The Manja Booth. <laughs> uh, that was probably my only uh, food experience, but the food experience incorporated with the professional experience as a salesperson gave me an insight into people, gave me an insight into knowing people, reading people, getting to know what they want, what you, know, what you can get out of people, and what you can give back to them. Then, I'm going to say, years went, years went on in the car business, and an opportunity arose from relatives of mine and some other partners at the time to open up a restaurant. Believe it or not, it was supposed to be a diner on Richmond Avenue. We went to the diner company. There's a group of about 10 investors of us, 10 partners. Everybody from who was a lawyer, who uh, was in charge of a maintenance company for elevators, who was a car salesman. Nobody with any practical experience to run a restaurant. So we went to a diner company which was a well-known Greek company that makes them, because obviously most restaurants, are, diners are owned by Greeks. So there's this big corporation out in Jersey that supplies the units for you. They finance you and everything. So they did a whole reference check and a credit check on all of us. And they stood there scratching their head saying, we're used to Greek people coming over, <laughs> hardworking people that are in the restaurant business their whole life, they want to buy a, a diner and we'll finance it and build it for them. They looked at us, they just shook their head and they said no. Who's going to run this place? They're saying. Well, they pointed to me, the used car salesman. They said, no, there's no way we're going to do this. And they said, well, who's going to be, who's the other partners? Well, he's a lawyer. He owns a clothing business. And it just passed. Right. From that, I had a relative of mine at the time who found a little obscure restaurant called the Harbor House. It was down in the Great Hills Harbor. Um, and he had the vision of putting up this restaurant. He, he got me involved. He got some other people involved, my partner at the time. And uh, he ended up developing, and we ended up developing all together the Marina Cafe. That was oh, well over 34 years ago. Wow. And that lasted up until Hurricane Sandy, obviously. And our experience from that grew, grew, grew. After Hurricane Sandy, I decided to uh, sell out my interest in the Marina Cafe. But prior to that, I had bought in a restaurant which was across the street, a floundering restaurant called the Windjammer. <clears throat> that I turned into a catering facility. Right after Hurricane Sandy, when I realized I was going to uh, sell out my interest in the Marina Cafe, I decided to take over the, uh, take the uh, Mansion Grand, which was the wind jammer at the time, and turn it into a restaurant and catering hall. And that's where we are today. Wow. So from your experience of being turned down to be a restaurant owner because you didn't have enough experience. Right. And the now people, 34 years later. <laughs> the people around you didn't have experience in the restaurant trade. So was it really 
learn as you go? Yes, I could of? say that because my partner at uh, my old restaurant had food experience. I had front of the house experience, he had back of the house experience. So we kind of complimented each other on that for 30 some odd years. Uh, his experience was more corporate. None of us knew anything about a restaurant. So it was a learning experience to say the least. And it took 30 some odd years and thank God it was successful. So much so that 20 years ago, I, like I said, I bought the Windjammer and turned that into a catering facility. And that became very successful. And because of Hurricane Sandy, we even opened up a restaurant inside there now too, which obviously right. you enjoy every now and then. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so uh, what was it like to see 30 something years of work in that, I mean, your, the experience of your restaurants being devastated in the storm was the most public display of how a business could be ruined. And what was it like for you at that time to realize, oh my God, what am I going to do? And how did you, what would you say contributed to your being, to bouncing back from it? I'm going to honestly say, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, the biggest contributing factor to bouncing back, because at this point now I'm in my 60s, um, in the business for 32 years up to that point, up until Hurricane Sandy. And I kind of say, well, I made my mark in life. But then I look back, I see my wife, I see my children, I see that they all have their own little interests and some have their careers. I say to myself, but what do I have to leave them? I says, you know what, let me rebuild the place. Uh, my partner was the same situation in, in, the, in the Mansion Grand. A young man, he's 10 years younger than me. He has three younger kids. I'm saying to myself, I could sell the property tomorrow and just maybe relax the rest of my life. And I was also selling the marina at the same time. And I says, I look back and I looked at the people behind me and I says, this ain't gonna happen. I wanna leave something. I wanna leave something for my wife. God bless her, she was the driving force for me keeping the restaurant. My children, so they always have something to fall back on. And my partner and his family. So we decided to rebuild the place, got on our hands and knees, and believe me, we were on our hands and knees for months afterwards and scrubbing floors, getting the place ready. And thank God the Mansion Grand Cafe and Catering Hall didn't take that much of a damage. I think it was the residual damage from Hurricane Sammy that did that place in more than anything else. It was no electricity for a month, no street passages. We had boats that went through windows. We had boats in our right. parking lots. It was, uh, and obviously we Definitely. lost all the whole, most of the first floor, but it was rebuildable very easily as yeah. opposed to my other restaurant, which was devastated. Right, right. So it, it took a, a, a certain level of, I think, just thinking about where do you want to go at this point? Is it really worth the time, the expense, the heartache, the dealing with insurance companies, <clears throat> dealing with so many different factors and having your family and, and partner just rooting for you in a sense? I don't know if they're rooting for me. I'm rooting for them more. Oh. Okay. Yeah. I'm at a point in my life right now, like I said, I could sit back and, and be relaxed, but I don't want to be. I look, I look at them and I say, they, wanna, they, want, they want something. They need something to carry on with. So I'm not going to sit back and say, let them look at me and say, everything's okay. Joey's happy. Don't worry about me. I made my mark already. Yeah. Yeah. And so everyone's involved in your business. Oh, yeah. Oh, all three of my children, too. All three of your children. Oh, I, yeah. I, they, they, my oldest daughter is a manager for me, who, God bless her, just gave me my first grandchild. Congratulations. Thank you. A little baby girl. Um, my wife uh, <clears throat> is uh, one of my assistant chefs. She does all the baking and all the restaurant creativity. We even named the restaurant after her because it was right. whole uh, whole idea that involved the, bringing a little cafe now instead of in, in, in addition to the catering hall. Right. Uh, my, old, my youngest daughter is a New York City school teacher, part-time as a bartender on the weekends. My son is still a, a college student, and he's a waiter on the weekends. Excellent. I mean, other than the dog and the cat, everybody's there. <laughs> and, they, and they're not afraid of hard work. You really oh, taught no. your family. I met my wife in my restaurant. Really? 30-some-odd 30 years ago, yeah. So oh, our romance kind of started from there. Right. So your, your family and yourself are no stranger to hard work. No, not and at all. Then, uh, and you tell me that from the old neighborhood, you said your, mo your mom worked at, uh, I asked if anybody <laughs> You remember worked, this one. <laughs> I remember this. You asked if, I asked if anybody in your family worked in the food business, and you said in, at the time you were slinging hamburgers, but your mom, tell us what your mom did. My uh, father, God bless him, and God rest both their souls now, my father was unemployed for a couple of years in our young life, in our, my young life, I should say. He was a, um, 
technician for a company called CBS at the time, not the TV station, a company that made TVs. And the company went bankrupt, and my father was out of work for like three to four to five years, I think it was, I'm not sure. His cousin, condiment, not condiment, I should say, God bless him, talked him into being, uh, taking the civil service exam. But it took three years to get on the, right. the call for whatever it was back then. So that in, in that interim, we're living on unemployment checks for a long time of our lives. My mother decided to go to work. She went to work right across the street from where we lived in a place called Mr. Donut <laughs> that we were talking about, which eventually turned into where I ended up working as an adult as a car salesman. And, that, oh, and, really? she, okay. and she was a, uh, a, a basically a donut waitress for most of my uh, teenage, not my teenage, but my uh, adolescence in St. Bernadette. <laughs> and uh, it's a funny story with uh, my mother as a donut waitress. If my grades were bad, which I hate to say most of the time they were, uh, she used to give me a dozen donuts to bribe the teachers when I went to school. <laughs> <laughs> and that and that got a, a little raise. Right? Yeah, I got a, I got a couple of marks up higher. Right, right. And what is she worked during the day? And did she, she no, work actually, at night? she worked a, a graveyard shift almost. She used to work from like nine o'clock at night till about uh, midnight. They closed, and then and then she used to go back in at four or five o'clock in the morning. And she was a baker there too. So she and she was doing this while my father was studying for the civil services exam. Wow. And then finally my father got called, but my mother never gave it up. She ended up going to work for another donut shop down 86th Street. <laughs> so hospitality is really in your blood, right? Yeah, people the work are. ethic, yep. the hospitality, liking to, you know, loving to be around people. Right, and I try and to install that in my children drastically. And you know, just hard work will get you hard, the things that you want in this world. Right, and, and you built your businesses not through any traditional education process. Correct. Right? It was mostly just dive in. Uh, you'll, uh, what do you, what do you want to call decision. it? Yeah, I guess street smarts, if you want to call it anything else. Yeah, it is called street yeah. smarts. And if you, so if you had to do this all over again, would you still be in the restaurant business? Yes, in a heartbeat. Yeah. But it's trials, it's tribulations, making money, not making money. Hurricane Sandy, and, you know, things like that. It's just, it makes you a better person. When it's, when it's all said and done, this is part of life's uh, learning experiences. That's right. And if there's anything you could, a message that you could give to existing or future entrepreneurs or students who are not sure, you know, what they want to do with their life, what would you recommend? Stay focused. <clears throat> if, you, if the career that you're looking for de uh, depends on an education, pr pursue that higher education. If it, you're not needed, get to work hard in that field. It might be a blue collar job, it might be a red collar, redneck, whatever you want to call it, concrete worker, whatever it is, get out there and don't be afraid to get your hands dirty. You need to do hard work if you want the rewards in life. You just can't sit back and it's gonna be handed to you. That's true, that's true. So, Joey, I want to thank you for coming on the show. Pleasure thank hanging you. out with you and your husband again. Oh, yes. And we're going to show a picture of you on your confirmation day. Correct. Me and your husband. Who? From? 1963. And what school was that? St. Bernadette. Oh, my. I wonder if anybody there will still remember Oh, yeah. You. They probably will. You still look the same. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the how full old? head of hair. You notice it. How, how old were you in that photo? I'm going to say, oh, I had to be 11 years old. Okay. I was born at 52, yeah. Right. All right. So uh, thank you, Joey, for coming on the Pleasure, show. Pleasure, Angie. Great seeing Pleasure. you guys again. Thank you very much. Uh, Frankie, I bow out, Frankie. <laughs> <laughs>
I got my first guitar maybe a month after I saw the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan Show. I wasn't born yet. <laughs> Thank you. And um, since that time, it's, I've gone through so many different musical genres, let's say, and um, I just got tired of being in cover bands, pretty much so. Now, we're still doing cover stuff, but um, I just thought that if I can come up with some songs, the person I want to sing it is Dawn. Thank you. You'll hear that on the tape. <laughs> so um, I don't know what makes us compatible. I think what makes us compatible is that um, we get along pretty well. We're a lot alike. We're really a lot alike. Mm -hmm. yeah. We both have ADHD. A Look, there's a rabbit. Okay. <laughs> like the clock's ticking right now, and I'm like 45, 44. Yeah, the same thing happened to me. For a second ago, I was like mesmerized by the clock. But I, I think our compatibility is based on the fact that we get along with each other. Um, I love how she sings. I hope I play guitar well enough for her voice. And um, and the cat loves her. Yes, our cat Penny loves Lane. her. Uh, so how did you, when did you begin singing, Dawn? Uh, I guess I sang, I sang a lot as a kid. Uh, when I was about nine or ten, I was asked by my teachers to enter a talent competition at PS22. And I was all set to do a Journey song, open arms, and the piano teacher had the music, and then the day of the show, he didn't have it with him. So I had to do it a cappella. And a lot of people I went to high school with, they actually remember that show. So that's, that's where that happened. And then, after that, it was just some karaoke. I was a karaoke DJ uh, for F2K. And then I went to Asbury and saw Christine Martucci. And she invited me up on stage with her. And uh, oddly enough, we were going to open for her uh, June 6th at the Wonder Bar in Asbury Park. So a How lot's exciting. happened. A lot's happened in a very, very short time. How exciting yeah. that is. And when yeah. did you start? Yeah. I know I wasn't even born yet. <laughs> <laughs> when did I start? What, playing? When, yeah, when was your first actual? Oh, my first gig. actual gig? October 1966. Not a thought. My parents weren't even married. <laughs> <laughs> Neither was I. I was 14. <laughs> so you, you really, uh, this shows how you really from two different generations. And so in a, in a very short amount of time, you met each other through your love of music, through right. being in a band together. You decided to follow some other paths musically together because you get along so well and your musical skills complement each other. And when, I think that when you have that passion, the age doesn't make a difference. And, no, definitely not. And, right. you know, it's, it's just a drive and a passion and a love of what you're doing and, so who, who does the music part and who does the business part? How do you get all these gigs? No, I'll, I'll do the music, I'll leave the business to her. Yeah, I do a lot of, uh, a lot of social media. I mean, w we've played one gig already and I have, uh, we have a Instagram page with over almost, it's About almost- 450 uh, now? Yeah, it's, it's almost 500 actually followers. That's, you know. Wow. At, at 15th Century Moxie, so that's Instagram. And then I, I have a Reverb Nation page we have which hooks up to YouTube and Facebook and, Everything's all connected, so um, it's just a lot of uh, it's a lot of work in that sense to you know call places and and send them the link and we do the business cards and you know we just get out there. So you know it's the it's it's working out well. I mean <laughs> we're booked for the summer, so that's good. That's great. That's great. So yeah, a lot has happened in two months, which is um, it's actually we're only doing this like I think it's like 21 days. Like, like, our, our something like that. Not yes. even a month yet. Since wow. our first gig. <laughs> yeah. So Monday yes. will be our, our first one month since our first gig. So, yeah. <laughs> Dawn is really the steamroller here, folks. <laughs> that really, you know, gets out there, does all the social media, and I'm I'm just amazed at your, uh, you know, the magnitude of what you've accomplished in this very short time. I mean, there are bands that. You know, being from a, a traditional band family, my, my children are musicians, my husband's musician. I mean, they go on the road, they, they create a CD. We called it an album back then. And those are the big ones, those right? Those are the big ones, yeah, those are the big ones. <laughs> Make great posters. <laughs> yeah, I didn't mention 8-track, no, no. And we, I mean, they went on the road and that's how they made money. But now you're, we're talking about a whole different level of marketing strategy, which is social media. You don't even have a website, no, but no. you have this, the songs that you sing and, and play together out there 
over the internet that people can listen to. Uh, you have people that liked your stuff that... We, we have nine songs out there that, were, that we recorded live on a little tiny Sony uh, recorder that was like 50 bucks. And, and we put that up on Reverb Nation and we broke, you know, the top 100 in, in two weeks. <laughs> that well, we're it only was, doing it a month, so it can't be yeah, that long. Two, yeah, you put them up <laughs> about, about two weeks ago. Yeah, weeks, so, and, and we weeks. broke the top 100. And, so. and I still can't believe it's a month, because I'm saying to myself, it's got to be at least four or five months. It has to be. It feels yeah. like or that. Or four or five just, years. Yeah. Everything is moving so quickly. The intention is not to be a cover band. I just need everybody to know that we're working on original stuff, and uh, hopefully we'll have that. But we will not release them before their time. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so what you're I going have to hear a lot of time. I'm not sure. Right. So what you're going to hear today is basically just cover stuff, because... Because right, because we right. can't. There. And what what would you call your style? <laughs> oh, go ahead. Proto punk acoustic power pop. I hate to give it a name, but uh, uh, proto punk yeah, acoustic power pop. What would you call it? You're there. You're there. Country uh, blues. I, I would just call it great sounding music. <laughs> okay. I would call it great sounding music. Um, it's just I I could hear when when you're gonna you're gonna play a few songs on the show, and you could hear the blend and the acoustics of how how you're just compatible and to use a, a catchphrase a synergy <laughs> between both of you that really works. So, um, what's what's on the what do you want to accomplish together? Definitely the original, definitely an original album. Uh, the fact that we get to play in Asbury is tremendous with, with very little exposure. Um, and that's really going to skyrocket us. And I think you know that. That's going to yeah. be crazy. Um, yeah. So I'd like to play there more, you know. Okay. And, and tour those clubs. And, um, like, so this, you've, all, you've been singing throughout your uh, childhood, adulthood, and uh, you have, but you have a traditional job. Uh, well, I was, I am a school teacher. I'm an English teacher, high school. And um, the, the reason this came about, I was unemployed for, for a couple of years. And, you know, I was doing the karaoke DJing and, and um, I, you know, I found this band and they needed a singer and, and, and that's how it happened. So it just, it just progressed from there, trying to make some money. And, and now, like I said, we're booked for the summer. So the money's coming and it's fun. It's a stress relief. So. It, yeah. it's, it's everything fun. So it's all what's, fun. what started out is the, the, the economic need right. to make a living and be self-supporting. You took your, your passion for music and collaborated with another musician. Right. And now that's, that's growing as exponentially as far as the material that you do and the places that you play. And um, you know, that's quite an accomplishment. It really shows, you, you know, you're truly an entrepreneur in the sense that you take risk. You know, you started out venturing in a different area, something that you love, uh, joined with somebody who, ordinarily, if it wasn't for that band, you would never really have gotten together, I don't right. think. And I really, I wouldn't have done this had Frank not been very supportive in you. and. Yoko, and uh, <laughs> her name's not Yoko, but she will be known as Yoko, okay? All right. All right. The name of the band is 15th Century Moxie. Right. How did you ever, ever come up <laughs> with a name like that? Okay, so I have a dog, I have a puppy, and we named her Moxie, and that's what she looks like. But what happened was, um, my partner and I were in the kitchen, and she looked down at the dog, and she goes, oh my God, she looks like a dog from the 15th century. And I'm like, oh my God, 15th century Moxie. <laughs> and like, that's the band. And then I went to rehearsal the next night to Frank. I said, Frank, what do you think if we do this band? Because we hadn't started yet. No, we, I, I need, said, hadn't even thought of it. We didn't even it. say anything. And I was like, what do you think if the band, the next band we're going to be in is 15th century Moxie? And he just started laughing. And now here we are. I love it. It's hilarious. Look at that. That's great. That dog, so the doggy really does look like this. <laughs> yes. Yes. What was the relevance to uh, Yoko finding? <laughs> um, her name is really Danielle, but we call her Yoko. Uh, you know, dog calls her Yoko. Um, what? She's famous now. Yeah. <laughs> what was the the relevance to 15th century? Like, what is what is? Um, da Danielle's, Yoko? An, Danielle's an artist. Danielle's a, a fine artist, actually, and um, that's her. That's her forte. So, so that's her, her area of expertise would be um, that area because she works with 
medieval manuscripts. And, um, you know, so when she saw it, it, it triggered something to I, quite frankly, would have never, ever seen that before. That's, that's something that never would have crossed my path had it not been for her. So. Right. So, so thanks to Danielle, the 15th century Moxie brand was born. Yes. With the, the, the doggy Moxie on there. And I want to thank Dawn Sansevero and Frank Franco for coming on the show. And we're going to hear some music from them and just enjoy. Is that okay? Is that good? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad we have an audience. Thank you. <laughs> if you like us, we're 15th century Moxie. If you don't like us, we're the Rolling Stones. <laughs> I'm going to do a very quiet one. Come on, baby. Let's get out of this town. I got a full tank of gas with the top rolled down. There's a chill in my bones. I don't want to be left alone. And baby, you can't sleep while I drive. I pack my bags and I load up my guitar. In my pocket, I I got some money I saved, enough to get underway. And 
Baby, you can't sleep while I drown. We'll go through Tucson, up to Santa Fe. And Barbara Nashville says we're well, welcome to stay. I'll buy you glasses in Texas, a hat in New Orleans. And in the morning, you can't tell me your dream. you take me with you and baby you can't sleep while I drive Can't you get that from me? Come on, baby, let's get out of this town. Got a full tank of gas with the top roll down. If you won't take me with you, I'll go before night is through. And baby, you can't sleep while I drive.
to look at he was a free rambling man but that was a long time and no matter how I try the years keep rolling by I woke up today Tell me how in the hell can a person Go to work in the morning Come on home in the evening They ain't got nothing to say Thank you, and get home safe. Thank you.
silver We're shaking lilies in the yard Your sweet face I will remember And how I'm gonna miss your stubborn heart For my weakness, I guess my faith is a little stone. The angels cried on that Friday, the day that God walked you home. It's a goodbye. Never seen that woman try so hard.